The equipment covered in this presentation should be installed, used, and serviced only by competent personnel familiar with and following good work and safety practices. This equipment is for use by such personnel and is not intended as a substitute for adequate training and experience in safe procedures for this type of equipment. These instructions do not cover all details or situations in equipment use, nor do they provide for every possible contingency to be encountered in relation to installation, operation, or maintenance. For additional information and details, or for specific situations not covered adequately for the user's purpose, refer the specifics to the A.B. Chance Company. A.B. Chance Company welcomes you to a seminar on temporary grounding. Your instructor today is Lonnie Bell, an A.B. Chance Hotline Tool Specialist and Demonstrator. Let's talk about grounding. Specifically, let's talk about temporary grounding for personnel protection. This has been something of a controversial issue throughout the electrical industry over the past few years. It seems that a lot of the controversy and the disputation has swirled around this issue of single point versus dual point grounding. I hope that by the time you've seen this presentation, you'll come to realize that that never was the issue. The term single point grounding was designed to be applied to a specific grounding technique. And it may be an unfortunate misnomer. I say unfortunate because the use of the word single introduces into the issue numbers, where numbers really don't need to be. There's a term that I like much better, and that term is equipotential grounding. Equipotential is a contraction of two words, equalized potential. And the creating of a zone of equalized potential is the single most critical element to be considered in any grounding program. When a power line is de-energized and temporary grounding is applied, you have certain objectives in mind. One of those objectives is to reduce the electrical potential of that line down to zero and hold it there as much as possible. A second objective is to create an exit avenue for any induced voltages or stray voltages that may be induced along the line. And you want to have a program in place that will, in the unfortunate and unlikely contingency that the line should become accidentally re-energized, that line will be returned to an open condition as rapidly as possible. Now those are the things you're trying to accomplish. And that's what you're trying to prevent. Now I'm going to show you a series of pictures now of an actual accident. It occurred in Jacksonville, Florida in 1967. A lineman working up a pole made contact with an energized conductor. By the time the other crew members found him, he was hanging upside down in his belt, he was unconscious, and he was not breathing. It happened that a newspaper photographer was present at the scene of the accident, and he got a series of pictures, for which in 1968 he won the Pulitzer Prize for photography on the strength of this photograph. Now I'm sure you recognize immediately that that's an outdated rescue technique. Dominant thinking in the industry, and has been for years, is to bring the man to the ground as rapidly as possible and then begin your resuscitation program. But in 1967, this was a very current thing to do. And it worked. He regained consciousness before he reached the ground. He was able to assist in his own rescue. Now they have him down on the ground. They're giving him oxygen. Look down at his right foot. You can clearly see the exit wound. This is where the current left his body. Now this is a situation where a man made contact with an energized conductor. This will inevitably be the consequence of something like that. We can say, and we would be right, had he been working on a de-energized and properly grounded conductor, that this accident could not have occurred. Now let me suggest a frightening possibility to you. That if, in fact, he had been working on a de-energized and grounded conductor, a conductor grounded using equipment and using techniques very commonly in use throughout the industry today, that under those circumstances there is a very real possibility that an accident like this one could occur. Contrary to popular opinion, that is not a photograph of our department head reviewing my expense reports. 
That's a test subject being subjected to an electric current. A few decades back, a tremendous amount of research was undertaken on the subject of the effects of electricity on the human body. And they actually found volunteers willing to do this. Some of the things they were looking for were perception current, the smallest current that the body can detect. At what level of current flow can you begin to feel? Reaction current, a current flow large enough to cause an involuntary reaction. By involuntary reaction, we mean simply loss of voluntary muscle control. And of course, let go current, the maximum current a person can tolerate and still release the conductor. How much current can you stand and still retain voluntary muscle control? Now, there were any number of these projects undertaken, and they all arrived at essentially the same results. If the results varied, they varied by a few milliampers here or there. I have a chart that I'm going to show you. It's entitled Quantitative Effects of Electric Current on Man. The chart is in milliampers. And for our discussion here today, we will restrict ourselves to the categories of alternating current, 60 cycle, and min. Now look over to the left-hand column, number one. Slight sensation on the hand. This is where you may begin to feel it. And look at the value. 0.4 milliampers. Or in other words, slightly less than one, than half, excuse me, slightly less than half of one one thousandth of an amp. Look at category number two, perception threshold. This is where you're absolutely clear. This is where you're certain that you're feeling electric current. And the value is 1.1 milliamps, or in other words, slightly over one one thousandth of an amp. Come down to category number five, painful shock, let go threshold. This is the maximum amount of current that you'll be able to tolerate and still retain voluntary muscle control. And the value we're looking at is 16 milliamps. Now I'll come down to the frightening one, category number seven, possible ventricular fibrillation effect. What the chart is telling us here is that with values as low as we see illustrated on the chart, these values were in some test cases enough to throw a heart into ventricular fibrillation. And you know what that is. That's where your heart leaves its normal beating pattern. It goes into a vibrating mode just prior to shutting off. There's no recorded instance of a heart going into fibrillation and ever recovering unassisted. If you get into that situation, you've got to have help, and you've got to have it fast. Now look at category A, 0.03 second shocks. That's three one hundredths of a second. At 60 cycles, approximately 1.8 cycles will lapse in that amount of time. Let's round that off to two cycles. And we're saying that for two cycles, 1,000 milliamps, or in other words, one amp, was in some test cases enough to throw a heart into fibrillation. Category B, three second shocks. Now three seconds is not a long time either, unless you're being subjected to an electric current. And for three seconds, we're looking at 100 milliamps, or in other words, one tenth of an amp. The value traditionally considered to be lethal dosage. Now, my object in showing you this is to illustrate that it takes an incredibly small amount of current to do catastrophic harm. You cannot afford to expose yourself to very much current for very long. And you need to be absolutely certain that your grounding program is protecting you against this possibility. We say that we ground a line to provide safety of the worker from induced voltage from adjacent lines, electromagnetic feed over from adjacent lines, or systems on the same structure. A storm on another portion of the system, which could give rise to a transient, that's a high-priced way of saying a lightning strike, or the ultimate contingency, the accidental energizing of a system following a standard operating procedure, or in other words, a human error. We'd like to believe that we've achieved a state of art in the industry today where this cannot and does not occur. The record clearly shows otherwise. It occurs with alarming regularity. And it has to be the chief consideration in your grounding program. 
You have to be sure that your grounding program will protect you from an accidental re-energizing of your system. We contend that the key to safe grounding and jumpering then is to keep the voltage drop across alignment to a minimum. A few moments ago, we looked at a chart that gave us some incredibly small values of current that could produce catastrophic harm. But before any current will flow, there has to be a voltage drop. If we can eliminate that voltage drop, we can eliminate that current flow. Now, I'm playing pretty fast and loose with that term eliminate there. What I mean by that is if we can keep that voltage drop down below the threshold of danger, we will likewise keep the current flow down below the threshold of danger. Now let's look at the way grounding has evolved over the years. There was a point in time when it was not unusual to see a grounding configuration like this. We have three phases being grounded by three long leads coming down to three individual driven grounds. The problems are obvious. The leads are long and heavy and cumbersome, and you have the problem of the earth resistance between the three driven grounds. Some improvement was made on this by eliminating two of the driven grounds and bringing all three leads down to one driven ground. But you still have the problem of the long down leads. Considerable improvement was achieved by this technique, jumpering all three phases together and then bringing one lead down to a driven ground. Repeatedly, tests have proven that jumpering three phases together will give you your best, your fastest breaker time in the event of an accidental reclosing of that breaker. That's putting a dead short on your system. Your breaker will see that sooner than anything else and react to it. And of course, with the down lead to a driven ground, you have your exit avenue for induced voltage. But all of these techniques overlook some fundamental aspects of electricity. Electricity is essentially amoral and totally indiscriminate. And by that, I mean simply it'll go anywhere there's a path for it to go. It'll harm anyone who gets in its way. Put an imaginary lineman on that structure. Standing near that center phase with his feet on the structure and his hands in contact with the center phase. What does he represent at that point? Very obviously, he represents an alternate path to ground. Think back to your basic fundamentals of electricity, parallel circuitry, resistors in parallel. What's the voltage characteristic of resistors in parallel? The voltage drop across each resistor is the same. A man in that situation represents a resistor in parallel. He is an alternate path to ground. If that circuit were to be accidentally re-energized, there would be a voltage drop across that man and a resulting current flow. Now this slide in its simplest possible form illustrates the concept of equipotential grounding. Consider what we have here. All three phases are jumpered together. This gives us our best breaker time. In this case, we're jumping from the center phase down to the structure. And we are bonding the lead to the structure just below the work area. Now consider what we have there. From this point of attachment upward, where this lead bonds to the structure upward, everything in that work area, every part of that lineman's body, and everything that he could possibly reach or touch is at the same electrical potential. Before you can have a voltage drop, you have to have a difference in potential. If we can effectively eliminate that difference in potential, we can eliminate the voltage drop. We can eliminate the current flow. We have achieved a zone of equalized potential, wherein everything that that lineman can reach and touch is at the same electrical potential. This is the essence of equipotential grounding. I approach the issue of single point grounding versus dual point grounding not from the standpoint that one is superior to the other but purely in the interest of illustrating some application techniques. This slide is entitled Jumpering Method of Two-Point Grounding on a Y-Connected System. 
The important thing to consider here is the sentence at the bottom of the slide. It says installed at each end of the work area outside the work area. The point being made, being made there is that this is not the structure you're going to work. We have all three phases jumpered together. And from A phase, we are jumpered down to the neutral. But very obviously, we have not created a zone of equalized potential. Jumpering method of two-point grounding on a delta-connected system. On a delta system, there is no neutral present on the pole. Therefore, we must rely on a driven ground and a lead from one phase down to and securely connected to that driven ground. This slide is entitled, Jumpering Method of Single Point Grounding on a Y-Connected System. Note the sentence at the bottom of the slide. It says, installed at the work site. Consider what we have here. All three phases are jumpered together. From A phase, we are jumpered down to the neutral. And from the neutral, we jumper down to a grounding cluster securely mounted on the pole well below the work area. From the point of attachment of that grounding cluster upward, everything on that pole is at the same electrical potential. Let me show you an example of a grounding cluster. It consists of a metal bar that attaches to the pole of the structure by means of a chain attached to a wheel binder. It simply clamps around the pole and provides metal contact all around the circumference of the pole. And of course, the metal bar provides a point of attachment for your grounding clamps. The ideal location for your grounding cluster is just below the work area, just below the lineman's feet where it will not represent an obstruction for the lineman working on the pole. Now let's look at a few more slides. This slide is entitled, Jumpering Method of Single Point Grounding on a Y-Connected System with an Undersized Neutral. Now what we mean by an undersized neutral is a neutral conductor that may not be equal to the available fall current. By definition, fall current is the maximum amount of current that a source can deliver to a site. The source, in most cases, will be a substation. How much current can that substation deliver to the point where the work is being done? Now, by virtue of the fact that you install a ground on the line, you ensure that in the event of an accidental re-energizing of that circuit, a fault current will flow because your source or your substation looks down the line when the breaker closes, sees virtually no resistance, and it just dumps everything it has out there. If your neutral conductor is not large enough to handle that value of current, you can augment that neutral by use of a driven ground and a lead from your grounding cluster down to the driven ground. This says jumpering method of single point grounding on a delta connected system. And of course, you can see we're jumpered phase to phase. From A phase, we jumper down to the grounding cluster and from the grounding cluster down to a driven ground. From the point of attachment of that grounding cluster upward, everything in that area is in a zone of equalized potential. Now, this is a technique well worth considering. It says two-point equipotential grounding system on a Y-connected system. The sentence at the bottom of the slide says, installed at each end of the work area, inside a work area, may also be used for single-point grounding. Now, you'll notice something here a little different than you saw before. Note, of course, that we're jumpered phase to phase. And then from A phase, we jumper directly down to the grounding cluster, and from the grounding cluster, back up to the neutral. The advantage of this is that it leaves us with only one ground clamp attached to the neutral conductor. As an example, if you had a fairly small neutral conductor, perhaps a high value fault current for long duration. What can happen if you have two ground clamps on that neutral? The conductor between those two clamps can act like a fuse. And of course, the object of a fuse is to blow. And this can happen. Now to compound all your other problems, you've got a neutral on the ground. It's a good idea to minimize the number of ground clamps that you have on your neutral in an effort to avoid this situation. 
Now, think back to the first slide that I showed you. And it said at the bottom of the slide, installed at each end of the work area, outside of the work area. Now, with the structure that we have on this slide, immediately one span to the left is a securely grounded pole. Immediately one span to the right is a securely grounded pole. At the work area, at this structure, all we need to achieve our zone of equalized potential is a grounding cluster attached to the pole and one lead from that cluster up to the neutral. And of course, two-point equipotential grounding system on a delta-connected system. This is simply a delta system in the same situation. We have immediately to the left a grounded pole, immediately to the right a grounded pole. At the structure we're going to work, we need only apply a grounding cluster and a lead up to the phase. Even on a Y-connected system, if you prefer to, you can jump her from the cluster to the phase. We say that we have a person on the structure and we have a person on the earth, and we ask, can we protect them both? Now, what are we talking about here? Very obviously, we're talking about step potential. Step potential is caused by a flow of fall current through the earth. This current creates a voltage drop at the Earth's surface. You have a point of entry for a fall current into the Earth. From that point of entry, a voltage gradient will radiate outward. A man standing in that voltage gradient will realize a potential difference between his feet, a potential difference which will allow a voltage drop which will produce a current flow you have a potentially life-threatening situation. This chart basically illustrates the situation. Here we have a structure, a fall current coming down that structure. The jagged line at the bottom of the slide represents the fall current, the voltage gradient radiating outward. You can see the man standing in that gradient. If you look up in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, you see an equivalency chart. Recognizing from this that in this situation, there would very definitely be a voltage drop across that man, producing a current flow. Now, nothing would please me more than to tell you that there's a simple and easy way to deal with this problem, and quite frankly, there isn't. About the best recommendation that can be made is the use of a localized mat at the base of the structure. It can either be a grounded mat or an insulating mat. Either one will create a situation at the base of that structure wherein there is no difference in potential between the man's feet. Now, you can see, obviously, what you've done here. You've moved the danger point outward from the base of the structure out to the edge of your mat. And you need to be aware of that problem. Touch potential is just another expression of the same problem. A man standing on the earth in contact with the structure represents an alternate path to ground. In the event that a fall current were to flow down that structure, there would be a voltage drop across that man, there would be a current flow through him. It essentially has to be dealt with the same way. some grounding equipment. 
Now, I have here an excellent grounding jumper. Would you agree? I sincerely hope that you wouldn't. What are the obvious problems here? Attached to each end of this piece of cable, we have a hotline clamp. A hotline clamp and a ground clamp are two different devices designed to do two different jobs. A hotline clamp is designed to carry a fairly low value current continuously. It's not designed, nor rated, nor tested for a fall current capacity. There's a limited amount of metal there and a limited amount of surface contact. This device will not stand a high value fall current. Note how it's connected to the cable. The insulation has simply been stripped off of the conductor and put in the eye bolt. What are the obvious problems there? There's a potential for corrosion buildup. How are they handled out on a crew? We all know the realities of life on a line crew. They're bent, they're twisted, they're subjected to rough treatment. This produces strand damage, strand breakage. What you've got there may be an excellent device to beat your dog with, but it's a poor tool to ground a line. A ground clamp differs from a hotline clamp in this respect. A ground clamp is designed to carry extremely high fault current values for short time durations. Now we have quite a variety of ground clamps in our AB Chance catalog and this is one of the smaller C-type ground clamps. And yet this clamp has been rated and tested repeatedly. It has a value of 30,000 amps for 15 cycles, 25,000 amps for 30 cycles. It has more than sufficient surface area contact with the conductor to ensure that during a fault current value of that size, this device is going to stay on the line. Now consider grounding cable. Essentially, there are two considerations in selecting cable. Number one is fault current capacity. Your cable has to stand the fault current. What we're looking at here, by the way, is a number two clear jacketed copper cable. It has a fault current capacity of 12,000 amps for 15 cycles. The other consideration in selecting ground cable is the interfacing or the interconnection between the cable and the clamp itself. It needs to be lowest possible resistance connection. In this case, we have the best of all possible connections. A compressed ferrule compressed onto the cable, threaded and lock nutted into the clamp. What we have achieved there is the lowest possible resistance from one end of that jumper to the other. Now let's consider some application techniques. There are two very serious considerations in applying temporary grounding, and both are frequently overlooked. The first one is cleaning the connections. This is a connection that you may have to rely on to save your life. It's critical that you clean that cable before you apply the ground set. There is also an option available. The ground clamps can be supplied with a serrated jaw insert. Now you can feel those serrations. They're not sharp. They won't damage the conductor. But they will bite through any corrosion and contamination that may have built up on the conductor and ensure that you get a clean, secure, low resistance contact. The other consideration is minimizing the cable slack. If a grounding set is subjected to a fall current, tremendous electromagnetic forces come into play and will cause a serious whipping action, a violent mechanical reaction in that ground set. Those cables can jump a considerable distance in just a fraction of a second, and they represent a serious hazard, a serious threat to anyone close enough to be contacted by those cables. Now let's summarize. In selecting ground clamps, we have two considerations, fault current and mechanical fit. Will the clamp stand up under the fault current? And will it give you a secure, low resistance connection to the conductor? Ground cable, again, we have two considerations, fault current capacity and the interfacing or the interconnection between the cable and the clamp. The cable has to be equal to the available fall current, and it's critical to have a low resistance connection between the cable and the clamp. Install your grounding assembly in such a fashion as to ensure that the men working on that structure are working in a zone of equalized potential, wherein everything that they can reach and touch and every part of their body 
is effectively at the same electrical potential. Now, is there anything we've overlooked up to this point? What's the last thing you do before you apply temporary grounding? Pull your hard hat down a little tighter. Maybe put your safety glasses on. Say a little prayer. Invariably, at this point, someone will say, you fuzz the line. Fuzzing the line consists of a lineman holding the metallic end of a hot stick up near the conductor and listening for that snapping, crackling, that static noise that indicates the presence of potential. Don't do that. That's a lineman's form of Russian roulette. The point that I'm making here is simply to check for potential before you apply temporary grounding. But check for potential using some kind of an approved instrument, either a voltage indicator or a voltage detector. But use some kind of an approved instrument and check for potential before applying temporary grounding. And in conclusion, remember to always treat an ungrounded conductor with the same respect that you would treat an energized conductor until that conductor is securely and properly grounded. And remember, if it isn't grounded, it isn't dead. Now let's look at some tests of grounding equipment that were conducted at the A.B. Chance Research Center in Centralia, Missouri. In each of these tests, we use essentially the same equipment, a 40,000 amp duct bill ground clamp and four odd copper cable. In the first test, using 15 inch phase spacing, we use a configuration consisting of three long leads coming from the duct bill clamp down to a common ground connection. Bear in mind that this is slow motion photography. That initial cable movement probably occurred in a fraction of a second. Continuing with 15 inch spacing, but changing the configuration now to a phase to phase jumpering with one lead down to the ground connection, we'll pulse this configuration with 11,000 amps. There you see a very dramatic difference in cable motion, emphasizing the need to minimize the cable slack. In this test, we continue with 15 inch phase spacing. We go back to our original configuration of three long leads coming down to a ground connection, pulsing at 18,000 amps. You can see that that would represent a serious hazard to a lineman working near that ground set. We go back now to our phase-to-phase -phase jumpering method, using one lead down to a common ground. Continuing at 15-inch spacing, we pulse now with 20,000 amps. Continuing the phase-to-phase -phase jumpering method and 15-inch spacing, we're up now to 40,000 amps. You'll like this test. What we succeeded in doing here was generating a phase-to-phase -phase fault. We took a little break in the filming here, and our cameraman went and changed his underwear. To save wear and tear on his nervous system, we went to 36-inch phase spacing, pulsing at 20,000 amps, using a configuration of three long leads down to a common ground. Note the tremendous cable movement. Continuing at 20,000 amps and at 36 inch spacing, we change our configuration to phase to phase jumpering. However, notice the long drooping leads and note how high they jump when they're pulsed with a fall current. That would be a serious hazard to any man working near that. Continuing at 20,000 amps, using the same phase to phase jumpering configuration, we shorten the leads. Even though we get essentially the same amount of motion, by shortening the leads, it would be more difficult for those leads to make contact with a man working near that area. Moving up now to 30,000 amps and continuing at 36 inch spacing, using the, the configuration of three down leads to a common connection. Continuing at 30,000 amps, changing to the phase-to-phase -phase jumpering configuration.
Note how high those cables jump. Continuing at 30,000 amps. Continuing with the phase-to-phase -phase jumpering method, but shortening the cables. Moving up to 40,000 amps and continuing at 36 inch spacing using the configuration of three long down leads. Note the clamp on the far left. That clamp was deliberately left untightened to illustrate what can happen when ground sets are improperly applied. Continuing at 40,000 amps and 36 inch spacing using the phase to phase jumpering method. Continuing again at 40,000 amps, 36 inch spacing, phase to phase jumpering with the cable shortened. You will now see a series of tests using the 8 foot T handle temporary driven ground rod. In these tests, you will note an incredibly long duration time. At the conclusion of the film, I'll explain that. In the first test, we put the rod in the ground one foot. We had a rod to station resistance of five ohms, pulsing with a fault current of 2,650 amps for a duration time of 53 cycles. In the second test, we again put the rod in the ground one foot with a rod to station resistance of 26.5 ohms, pulsing with a fault current of 4,630 amps for a duration time of 123 cycles. Bear in mind that these tests were done in central Missouri in the dead of winter. In the third test, we put the rod in the ground six feet with a rod to station resistance of 17 ohms, pulsing with a fault current of 3,450 amps, again, for 123 cycles. There's ignition, and we have liftoff. In the final test, we used two rods in parallel. We put the rods in the ground six feet with a total rod to station resistance of nine ohms, pulsing with a fault current of 4,320 amps for a duration time of 61 cycles. We normally conduct these tests just before we go fishing. It gets all the worms out of the ground. Now let me explain something about those long duration times that you saw in the ground rod test. By using a long duration time coupled with a low fall current, we were able to simulate what would actually occur with a much higher fall current and a much shorter duration time. The AB Chance Company earnestly recommends whenever using a temporary driven ground rod, place it as far as possible from the work area and barricade it. Protect both yourself and your public. Now let's look at the grounding simulator. This is the AB Chance Company grounding simulator kit. Let me explain some things about it. It's designed to simulate a three-phase distribution line with a low mounted neutral. Note these wires coming down the poles. Now those wires don't represent the pole ground. Those wires represent the pole itself. A pole has to be considered a conductive surface. The simulator unit is made of epoxy glass. Epoxy glass has a 100,000 volt per foot dielectric value. There are no poles in the field that have that. If there were, it would solve a lot of problems for you. But because the unit is made of epoxy glass, we use these wires to represent the pole. Representing our linemen, we have a 500 ohm resistor 
in series with a small light. This upper connection represents the lineman's hands working on the conductor. This lower connection represents the lineman's feet standing on the structure. The entire unit is energized and grounded through this energizing device on the stool. Let's ground this line. And as we do, let's incorporate into our grounding program everything we've been taught about grounding over the years. We'll stipulate at the beginning that we've tested for potential and we've cleaned our cables. Now, one thing we've always been taught over the years is to always place the ground between the source and the work site. This is our source. This is our work site. So we'll place our first set of grounds between our source and our work site. Another good idea we've always been taught has a variety of names. You can call it working between grounds or grounding from every possible source of feed. So let's just put this man between grounds by applying a second set of grounds on the opposite side of the work site. Now, what more could we do for that man? We have a ground between him and the source. He's working between grounds. We've been willing to believe that he's protected. Let's energize that line and see what happens. Well, what do you think? You think we killed this guy? It's possible that we did. There's no way that we can say for sure because it's going to be different in each and every situation. There is one thing we can say with unequivocal certainty. There was a voltage drop between this point and this point. Or in other words, a voltage was impressed across that lineman. And where a voltage drop occurs, there will be an accompanying current flow. And if you remember the chart that I showed you earlier, it requires an incredibly small amount of current for a very short period of time to produce catastrophic results. So how are we going to protect this man? Let's come to the work site. And we'll install on the structure where he's working a grounding cluster bracket. We'll let this little spring here be our grounding cluster bracket. And from that grounding cluster, we will attach a lead no further than the neutral. And let's re-energize again. What happened that time? Or more accurately, what did not happen? Obviously, there was no voltage drop across the lineman. Reason being, we had equalized potential throughout the work area. We had created a zone of equalized potential. The line was just as hot as it was before. But every part of that lineman's body, everything in the work area, was energized at the same potential, precluding any possibility of a voltage drop and a current flow through that man. What you see before you now is basic dual point grounding. Grounding on both sides of the work area at the work site using the grounding cluster and a lead up to the neutral to create a zone of equalized potential. Now let's drop back to single point grounding. By definition, single point grounding is a single set of grounds installed at the work site. All right, let's do that. We'll do that by eliminating one set of grounds. And at the same time, you've probably observed by now, we've committed what we always thought was one of the cardinal sins of grounding. Our ground assembly is on the opposite side of the source. The lineman now is between the ground and the source. Is he protected? Of course he is. And why was he protected? Because he was still in a zone of equalized potential. Now, when I talk about a concept like having the ground between the man and the source, I'm not trying to discredit that idea. My object is to point out that of and by itself, that concept has no power to protect you. 
And the reason it doesn't is because when that line becomes energized through an accidental closing of the breaker or perhaps contact with a foreign line, when that line becomes energized, the entire line becomes energized and stays energized until the fault clears. And having the ground between you and the source of and by itself has no power to protect you. Let me illustrate that further. Let's put the ground back where we've always been taught that it should be and where probably it should be. Now, let's get serious here. This man is working on the center phase. So not only will we place the grounds between him and the source, we'll place additional grounds on that center phase. How much better protected could this man be? Obviously, he was not protected at all. It doesn't matter if you have a dozen grounds on that line, and they're all between the man and the source. Unless you create a zone of equalized potential, if that circuit is re-energized, there will be a voltage drop across that man. And if that voltage drop endures for only a very short duration, it may be enough to produce catastrophic results. In anticipation of some of your questions, let me make one or two points. Equipotential grounding is as important for bucket truck work as it is for working from the structure, because the key word there is work. A man working from an aerial device such as a bucket truck in the course of work will frequently be in contact with different surfaces. He may have his shoulder against the cross arm while his hand is on the conductor. He may have his back against the pole while his hands or part of his upper arm is in contact with the conductor. He is frequently in contact with different surfaces. And if those surfaces are of unequal potential, that man is at risk. One of the most frequently asked questions about equipotential grounding regards the presence of a pole ground on the pole. And the question is, wouldn't the presence of a pole ground on the pole effectively create the zone of equalized potential? And the best response that I can give to that is that the pole ground is unreliable. It simply cannot be depended upon to do anything. There are too many variables there. The size of the pole ground. How well is it stable to the pole? The resistivity of the pole. How good is the connection between the pole ground and the neutral? All of these are unanswered questions. And they would be unanswered at every work site. The best possible thing to do with a pole ground in your grounding program is just simply to ignore it and not rely on it to do anything for you. Ultimately, it comes down to this. If there is a difference in potential between two surfaces, and you're bridging those two surfaces with your body, if one of those two surfaces becomes hot, a voltage will be impressed across you. And where there is a voltage drop, there will be an accompanying current flow. And if you remember the chart that you saw earlier in this presentation, it requires an incredibly small amount of current for a very short time to produce catastrophic results. The only way that you can adequately protect yourself with temporary grounding is by incorporating into your grounding program the concept of equalized potential, which can be accomplished by use of the pole-mounted grounding cluster with a lead to the neutral, which is sometimes called the personal protective ground. I hope that this presentation has helped you to understand the concept of and appreciate the need for equipotential grounding.